This video is brought to you by Skillshare. In India, the average person uses 964 kilowatt hours of electricity every year. In Europe, this number is 6,500 kilowatt hours. And for the United States, 13,000 kilowatt hours. But we've been catching up. This number has doubled in the last 20 years. And barring some cataclysm, we will continue to grow. Until our per capita electricity consumption and thus lifestyle resembles that of Western countries. And we're not alone. Throughout the developing world, the need for electricity is increasing. Our industrial and economic growth depends on it. The most common resource to fill this growing need thus far has been coal. But coal power plants have an extraordinarily negative impact on public health. And with the specter of global warming looming over the horizon, this clearly cannot continue. Luckily, solar power is cheap. And we have plenty of sunshine thanks to our proximity to the equator. But day still turns to night and monsoon clouds cover the entire country for three whole months every year. You can manage intermittency by building backup systems around renewables, like peaker plants and batteries. But as a higher percent of the grid becomes more reliant on renewables, the costs of managing intermittency start to skyrocket. And the peaker plants that fire up when production is down, those run on fossil fuels, which means you're still producing carbon dioxide and paying a much higher price per kilowatt hour than if the plants were running near 100% capacity. So it's not workable to replace coal with renewables completely. For that, you need a power source that's dispatchable, something that produces electricity when you need it. Luckily, we have such a source. Humanity tamed the power of the atom seven decades ago, and we've tested it at scale in several countries, notably France, where it provides 70% of the country's electricity needs. And despite a strong push to phase it out after Fukushima, they seem to be warming to it again. But even the staunchest advocates of nuclear power won't deny that it's getting costly. The plants take ages to make, there are almost always delays and problems, and the public still has a negative perception of nuclear power, at least when compared to renewables. Thorcon wants to change all that. Their reactor design claims to produce safe, carbon-free energy at costs lower than coal. It can run for 60 years and has modules that can be easily replaced. And the best thing, they can build these reactors in a year, far from the five years it usually takes, and at a much lower cost. What's their secret? Their reactors won't be built on site as huge civil engineering projects. They'll be built and assembled in shipyards. Jack Devani, one of the founders and an MIT professor, has designed four of the largest oil tankers in the world. His solution to the high costs and long time scales of nuclear power projects is to have a design that can be mass produced in a shipyard by people who already have experience with hard deadlines and exacting specifications. The plant will be built in modules with work on several happening parallelly. Then it'll be assembled and towed to its final location where it'll sit on the ocean floor and hook up to the local grid. Sounds incredible, doesn't it? Well, let's examine their claims and see how it works. But before that, let's examine our sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes for creative and curious people. Discover new skills, explore existing interests, and get lost in creativity. It's curated specifically for learning meaning there are no ads, and they're always launching new premium classes, so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. I've been working on YouTube success, script, shoot, and edit with MKBHD, and it's full of insights about how to think about your workflow, your audience, and growing your channel, whether you're a beginner or an old hand looking for something new. Skillshare has something for every level of expertise. When you join, you can try one of Skillshare's live classes. Experience real-time inspiration as you connect with popular teachers while watching and working along with other members. And it's not just the lessons. Skillshare also has a vibrant community where you can connect with fellow travelers for encouragement and inspiration. The first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get one month free trial of Skillshare so that you can start exploring your creativity today. The key component of Thorcon's design is the can. This contains a pot through which the molten fuel salt is circulated and the primary heat exchanger through which the heat from fission is transferred to the rest of the plant. When a uranium atom splits, neutrons are produced. These neutrons can either float away, get absorbed, or cause fission. The pot contains rods of graphite, 
And when we pump fuel salt into the pot, the neutrons bump into the carbon atoms of the graphite and slow down. These slowed down neutrons are much more likely to cause fission. When the neutrons released from one fission cause one more fission, the reactor is said to be critical. Which means it generates a constant amount of heat. The heat would be a problem if it just sat around. So the fuel salt is circulated by a pump. When it goes to the primary heat exchanger, the secondary salt inside absorbs this heat which is then used to generate steam. And as long as we remember to keep the steam under our pillow, the turbine fairy will exchange it for electricity sometime during the night. We call this the Rankin cycle and it's what all coal power plants use. The upside of this is that the power generation of Thorcon's plant can just be from off-the-shelf components. So what if the pump circulating the fuel salt fails? The fuel salt will stop circulating and we won't be able to remove the heat from the pot. If enough heat builds up, the temperature will rise above their working temperature of 700 degrees Celsius and could weaken the steel. Here's where the liquidity of the fuel becomes useful. Remember, fission only occurs when there's a moderator? So they keep a little segment at the bottom of the pot frozen using helium. When the temperature of the fuel salt rises beyond 750 degrees, this section melts. And the fuel salt does what liquids do. It flows to the bottom into the drain tanks. There is no moderator here, so fission can't happen. But there will still be some heat produced due to the decay of fission products, the elements that were formed when uranium split. But that will be safely radiated to the cold wall, which is a sandwich of water and two layers of steel. There is enough water here to continuously remove heat for six months. By that point, the heat generated by fission products will be minimal and can be cooled by air. But there is another property of molten salts that means that it probably won't ever come to this. The criticality of a mass of uranium, be it solid, liquid or gas, depends on how close the atoms are to each other. When molten salts heat up, they expand, causing the uranium atoms to move further apart and the number of fission events to go down. This is known as a negative temperature coefficient of reactivity. The higher the temperature, the fewer the number of fission events. And because of this, the fuel begins to cool down on its own without any operator intervention. This also means that they can load follow, meaning the power output adjusts itself based on the requirement coming in from the grid. With their designs, they can do this at a rate of 5% per minute, above 50%, which seems adequate according to EU rules. It's a little slower under 50%, but it can still be done. This is important because there are a lot of renewables being installed and they likely have to work in grids with intermittent energy sources. Coming back to safety, the last feature is one that's common to most nuclear plants. Three control rods, any of which would stop the fission if inserted into the pot. But let's be real here. Nuclear power plants already have an excellent safety record. One of the best. So while Thorcon's design does have a lot of passive safety features, they still need to tackle the biggest issue facing nuclear power today, the cost. So let's see what they're doing on that front. The safety features we discussed just now do have a bearing on the cost. In most reactors today, we use water as a working fluid. But to create steam with any reasonable efficiency, it needs to be hot like 350 degrees Celsius hot. And the only way to keep it liquid at 350 degrees is to pressurize it. If we lose pressure for any reason, it'll turn into steam all at once and expand massively. This expansion slash explosion can spread radioactive fission products into the environment, which is the main risk with any pressurized water reactor. To prevent this, Almost every nuclear plant has to make a containment building. Three feet thick walls of reinforced concrete to keep any radioactive material from escaping. The molten salt fuel used by Thorcon doesn't need high pressure to stay liquid. Its boiling point is 1400 degrees. You're not walking as much of a knife edge there and have a bigger margin for temperature and pressure fluctuations. Even if the fuel salt does escape the pot somehow, it'll just solidify into a solid mass. There's no plausible method for dispersing it into the outside world. And because of that, you don't need a containment building. That saves money and time. But time is money, so really just a lot of money. And I didn't know this until we made a few videos about nuclear power. But the cost of nuclear fuel is lower than both coal and natural gas. You'd think it'd be really expensive to get uranium ore to a state where it's fit to be used in a nuclear plant. But it really isn't. You need so little of it for an equivalent amount of energy to coal that it skews perceptions a bit. The thing that makes nuclear power expensive is really the cost of borrowing money 
and how long it takes for the plant to be built. Because you'll only start getting money back once it's generating electricity. Here's a great video that deals with the economics of nuclear power in more detail. For us, it's sufficient to know that the faster you can make a power plant, the cheaper the electricity. Since Torcon will leave the fabrication of the modules to shipyards, a lot of the processes will have fixed costs. Like $2,000 per ton of high-precision steel fabrication. Don't say I never give you knowledge to drop at parties. And there are other benefits that come with a mature manufacturing system, like definite schedules, penalties for delays, etc. Remember, the more developed a process, the closer the overall cost comes to the cost of the materials. This is something every modular nuclear power plant talks about, the economies of scale. But they'll take a long time to get there. In Thorcon's case, they already have a 3,000-year head start. More if we're counting the elves of Middle Earth. And shipyards aren't building ships 365 days a year. They have plenty of reserve capacity. According to Thorcon, enough to make 101 gigawatt plants every year. That's like what of the total nuclear capacity we have today, every year. Okay, we'll give them the safety features and low cost. But how do they deal with nuclear waste? The graphite moderator in the pot will slowly wear out under high temperature and neutron radiation. And they'll have to replace it every four years. But instead of replacing just the moderator, it's easier to replace the entire can. The fuel salt will be pumped into a second canister while a Thorcon ship comes in to replace the first one. The second canister will then run the fuel for another four years. At the end of the eighth year, the fuel salt will no longer be able to sustain fission. Then they'll pump it into a shipping cask and send it off to one of Indonesia's 13,000 uninhabited islands. We can reprocess this fuel to use again. But uranium is pretty cheap, so right now there's no economic incentive to do so. But the time may come when we call upon it to make clean energy again. Possibly in fast neutron reactors. Like the one designed by Elysium. You should definitely check out that video too. Now, the reason the fuel is able to last for eight years is because there's some thorium in there too. Remember how we said the neutrons from fission could float away, get absorbed or cause more fission? Some of the thorium will absorb neutrons and turn into uranium-233, a great fissile fuel. And in total, 50% of the energy will come from thorium that's been converted to uranium-233 and uranium-238 that's been converted to plutonium. It's not a full-on breeder reactor like Kirk Sorensen's lifter, but it can still get that extra mile out of the fuel. Solid fuel needs to be replaced much sooner due to the buildup of gaseous neutron absorbing fission products inside the pellets. Thorcon will be able to deal with these more easily since they'll bubble out of the liquid. From there, they'll be guided into a tank where they can safely decay away. Since fuel is constantly being burnt up, they'll need to keep topping it off with enriched uranium. The next step for Thorcon is to build a pre-fission test facility. This will help them see how their reactor responds to different situations. They'll generate the heat electrically rather than using fission. So this only tests the thermal performance of their salts, the pumps, etc. Allowing them to work out all the kinks on the non-nuclear front. After this, they'll get a 500 megawatt plant commissioned by the Indonesian government, which they'll bring online after extensive testing. And if all goes well, they'll look to add 3 gigawatts of total capacity to Indonesia's grid. Their final journey will likely not be as straightforward as this. The fuel they plan to use, that is 20% enriched uranium, may not be available immediately. So they will have to go with a 3% enriched uranium. This will require the fuel to be replaced every two years instead of eight. They also have to convince a lot of people. The Russian floating nuclear plant, for example, wasn't exactly popular with the public. Fine, this is not floating, but it's an alien enough concept that is sure to raise some eyebrows. Not everyone knows that there have been lots of floating nuclear reactors. They're actually pretty common. And the 100 gigawatt capacity sounds great, until you realize that most developing countries don't have that many nuclear engineers. The plant may be really easy to operate, but will still require a large, well-trained workforce, because the stakes are really high. Even one minor accident could set the industry back decades. To their credit though, they've built the reactor in such a way that catastrophic failure is really unlikely, even in case of operator error. While researching this topic, I found a video where Chris Anderson was talking about this company. If you aren't familiar with the name, he's the guy behind TED. This person has basically heard every single pitch for future energy, battery breakthroughs, life-changing technology, the whole works. 
most science YouTube videos can probably be traced back to some TED talk. Well, this guy also happens to be one of the principal investors of Thorcon. That is not proof that this is the right way to go, but it definitely shifts your priors. His rationale for backing Thorcon is that he sees it as something that's scalable because the machine that builds the machine already exists. And yeah, if we can mass produce extremely complicated piece of electronics, like the smartphones, if we can trivialize the manufacture of incredible machines like airplanes and cars, then maybe the next step for humanity is mass producing power plants. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please subscribe to the channel, it really helps us out. And also a shout out to Gordon, who has uploaded hundreds of hours of talks and conferences to his YouTube channel. His work enables a lot of secondary content like ours. Alright, that's all for this time. I'll see you really soon. Bye-bye.